Okay. Um, I'm Anna Kropp. Uh, I am the owner of Eclipse Alapaha Blue Blood Bulldog, and we are located in Ohio. Um, I have had dogs my entire life. Uh, my mom was a professional trainer, and she used to go to the pound, and we would pull five, six dogs out at a time. And it was mostly purebred dogs that people had dumped you know a lot of it was for behavioral issues you know sometimes it was issues with you know house breaking potty training simple issues you know that people just didn't want to deal with so they'd end their dogs in the pound and um like i said you know we would have five and six dogs at the same time and she would rehab rehabilitate them and you know find them appropriate homes and um we moved out to the country and somebody had tried to break into our home. Uh, my, my sister actually looked out the window as they were looking in the window and it was probably 3 a.m. in the morning and my mom's like, oh my gosh, we have to get protection, a protection breed of some kind while we're out here in the country. So we started looking into different various protection breeds and we ended up with Connie Corsos. So um, we really didn't have any intentions of being breeders. Um, we showed them. And uh, the Connie courses we ended up having for about 16 years, we had a female that was a Sicilian import. And then we also worked with Tony Scandi from Scandifio Connie Corsos. Um, but I had always had an affinity for pit bulls, bulldogs, you know, more of the bully type breeds. And we were actually at a dog show in Medina County Fairgrounds. And there were two people there and they had Alapahas. And it was funny because previously we had actually talked to Lana Lou Lane on the phone multiple times. And we were kind of going back and forth, you know, and it was mainly for my sake that my mom would call Lana for me. And then I would sit next to her and listen in on the conversation because I just was really smitten with these bulldogs. But I actually got to see them in person. And this was in the mid 90s. Um, and I just, oh, I just fell absolutely in love with their big meaty heads and, you know, their personalities and, you know, they were just, they were so impressive. So I talked to them, you know, for a while and I ended up getting my first Alapaha, uh, in 95 or 96. Uh, and it was just, it was just a phenomenal breed. It was just a fabulous dog. And, you know, I mean, ever since then, it's just been, you know, uh, a love affair with this breed. Um, I could, I could, I really could go on and on and on about them, but, um, you know, I mean, my dog, she, she actually saved my life from a carjacking. There was a man that, you know, he was drunk. He sat in the car next to me and, you know, he, the key was in and the car was still running because I had a boyfriend and he was just running in to grab some cigarettes or something. And, you know, this guy sat in the car next to me and he's like, how do you put the seat back? You know, and I'm like, oh my gosh, like, what are you trying to do? And, you know, he just grinned at me and my, my dog came in through the window, the back window of a pickup truck. And he grabbed her, she grabbed him by the shoulder and he screamed and, and wrestled and he got away from her and he ran off. But, you know, I mean, it, it's just, it, these dogs, their, their natural ability to detect a stranger, to detect somebody that's up to no good is like, unlike any other breed that I've come across, like it is natural, it is genetic and it is hardwired into them to be a protection dog. You know, and like, I mean, this is the same dog that I could take to a park and kids could pet, you know, and, you know, she's, she's always, she was always like distrustful of men. And I've noticed that that is like, the Alapaha seems to have a, a natural distrust in men for whatever reason, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be vicious or aggressive or like just randomly attack people. They should never be like that. But this, the natural guardian instinct is what, what really hooked me onto the breed. And, you know, I've, I've just had them ever since. And uh, uh, like I said, I had no intentions on breeding, doing any kind of breeding like that. But um, we ran into a lot of health problems with the breed uh, over time. And, you know, I almost felt like it was my duty, you know, because I love the breed so much to try to breed a healthier bulldog. And that's kind of how we evolved to where we're at today. Could you um, just give a brief overview, as you know, the history of the Alapaha 
and and what it um, is made of and all that? Well, that's that's a bit of a can of worms. Uh, you're going to have a lot of people saying a lot of different things, but mainly it was a breed that has always been around to an extent, not purebred. You know, people didn't keep paper trails and stuff like that like we do today. But, you know, in the South, there are people that had game dogs, people that had, you know, ranch hands, people that had hog dogs for hog hunting. And, you know, if somebody had a really nice dog, they would just throw the dogs together and they basically were breeding them for the workability, you know, for the temperament. And the Alapaha basically comprises of the, you know, white English bulldog, the original white English bulldog, not the English bulldogs that we see today that, you know, are super brachiocephalic, short squatty, you know, are basically pets. Um, these were the long legged gamey, you know, defensive bulldogs that they used for hog hunting and catching and livestock guardian work. Um, and, you know, some say there's Catahoula leopard dog, which makes sense, you know, that Catahoula for the color or whatever, but, you know, mainly for their workability as well. Um, some say black mouth cur, some say great Dane. So, I mean, you'll still see the phenotypes in these different breeds today in the Alapaha. You'll find Lapahas that are leggier, Lapahas that are shorter and squattier. Um, in the 90s, uh, old English Bulldog was added to make them shorter and squattier and more marketable. Um, some people say it makes them prettier. So, you know, it's... Uh, They've been around for a while though. Like I said, in the South, people have been breeding these kinds of dogs for you know, a hundred years, maybe even longer. And what is the style that you prefer and what you try to, to uh, base your program off of? So I like what people consider a hybrid style. Um, and that's a dog that has a little bit longer of a muzzle, longer legs, uh, more heat tolerance, uh, you know, can perform in various tasks. Like I personally enjoy personal protection and IPO work. And I need a dog that can handle 90 degree temperatures, a dog that, you know, isn't going to gas out real fast when they're working. I mean, in IPO work, they have to be able to do tracking, they have to be able to do obedience, and they have to be able to perform in bite work. So, you know, you need a dog that's extremely intelligent, a dog that is a handler submissive, a dog that wants to please, wants to obey, uh, a dog that is, you know, um, driven, prey driven, you know, and a, and a dog that's going to react appropriately. So you want a dog that is very stable in, in mind, very stable. Um, so yeah, I would, my dogs would probably be considered a hybrid between the Lana and the CRK lines and CRK lines tend to be the shorter, squattier, brachiocephalic, very bully. Um, you know, I've had both on my yard. Um, and I definitely prefer the hybrid because they just meet exactly what I need. Talk about um, your experiences with their um, uh, training them in um, the IPO work and, and that sort of stuff. Because, I, I, you know, I'm owning bull breeds most of my life and being around bull breeds. Everything but the American Pit Bull Terrier seem to be like the, the most difficult to train. They're, they're smart dogs. I think people don't realize how smart bull breeds are, but they're stubborn. Can you talk about how you've gotten past that? And if, if there's any, are they more trainable than say an American or like an English or whatever? So I don't like the word stubborn. Uh, they get bored. They get bored. And you have to find what motivates them. Um, I, you know, they're very, very food motivated, um, you know, but I find them to be extremely trainable. Um, but, you know, then again, people say French bulldogs are impossible to train too. And we have two French bulldogs and they are unbelievably well trained. My daughter has her little female Frenchie, uh, you know, groomed and trained for like IPO work. She could, she could actually do IPO work. Um, so well, you then really... I need to send my Frenchies to your house and mine are, <laughs> I'll send you videos. I'll send you videos. Um, it's, it's about connecting with the dog. It's about finding what motivates them. You know, you have to be able to speak their language, you know, and, and when you get, when you, when you find what 
motivates your dog, you utilize that. So, you know, I mean, I find the Alapaha to be extremely trainable. Um, I find them to be probably be the easiest to train and smartest bulldog breeds out there. And, you know, maybe that's unfair to say because there's a lot of people that really struggle with them and, you know, thinking that they're stubborn or whatever. And they're, it's, that's not the case. They're typically bored. And like my professional trainer always tells me, you have to be more interesting than dirt. So, and what that means is, is that if you're not, you know, interacting with your dog, speaking to your dog, motivating your dog, it's going to go over there and sniff a patch, patch of dirt because that's more interesting than you are. So you really want to build a relationship and have a friendship with your dog. And like, when you have that, they are going to do anything for you. And I mean, anything. Yeah, that's, that's well said. I, I, I can definitely see that with a lot of dog, bulldog breeds. Um, it, it does take a, a certain kind of patience, I guess. It definitely does. And they're, you know, they're, they're a slow to mature dog. So, you know, like, um, there's other people that have started their dogs with personal protection work or like ad advanced obedience work, and they kind of give up on them because, you know, I, these dogs are taking two, three, and sometimes even four years to, to fully mentally mature. Yeah. So you really need to give them that time and just continue to work with that dog until you get the results that you want. It's funny. I have a livestock guardian dog and, um, I've, been amazed at how long it did take him to to fully like mature um he's three and a half well almost mm -hmm. yeah three and a half so and he's just now kind of coming into his own and a little more serious and and yes. subdued so yep um talk about your reception with the ipo world uh with a bulldog is, is there what kind of reception do you get and so most people find it interesting that I'm working with an off breed, you know, the, almost everybody in the club has either a shepherd Al a Malawi, um, you know, and it just, it, it does take a lot longer to get any titles with an Alapaha than it does with a Malinois or a German shepherd, you know, um, because Alapahas think for themselves, you know, and, and German shepherds, Malinois are more of a push button type dog, you know, and I mean, let's face it, they were, genetically bred to perform these tasks, right? And the Alapaha was bred more for being independent, thinking for themselves, you know, doing guardian work or, you know, on ranches, you know, I've, I've got Alapahas that are living on cattle ranches, you know, and they help their owners catch and hold bulls or calves or, you know, helps load them up on trucks and load them off trucks and stuff like that. So the dog really has to think independently. And that's where you go back to having a good relationship with the dog. But, you know, um, the reception that I've had has been great. Like, you know, they, they congratulate us for, you know, working with an off breed and for doing so well with them. I, you know, I, I don't know if I would necessarily call anyone a mentor mentor. Um, I, my mom was my mentor, you know, like, everything that you know i've i've learned over these years has pretty much been from my mom but you know i mean i I've, I've talked to a lot of people in the breed you know melissa pine you know from pine time alapahas like i talked to cj from land shark kennels um thomas lingren um from lingren estate you know so i i've had working relationships with people you know i mean there's people over in the uk that i've talked to so you know and we talk about history, we talk about temperament, we talk about where we'd like to see this breed end up in the future. Um, you know, so yeah. Uh, but it, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know if I would necessarily call anybody a mentor, you know, but yeah, they, they've, they've definitely, you know, given me insight and direction and, you know, um, things to think about. We're, we're in an information age and, and there's nothing like, uh, learning hands-on, you know, absolutely. Absolutely. So, a lot of trial and error, you yeah. know, make a lot of mistakes because like, you know, some of the, it's, I don't know, some of the, uh, uh, um, advice that I've gotten for people from people has been incorrect, you know, and I've had to find out on my own through trial and error. Not that, you know, the information that they gave me was, you know, um, terrible information, but you know, most of it is, most of it is trial and error learning. 
And could you talk about some of the the the, the personality traits about the Alapahas? Kind of go in depth with that as far as uh, what really drives you to 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 carry on and preserve this breed, and you know things like. You know, what are they like with same sex? Uh, what are they like in the house? Uh, are they a house dog? Or are they just primarily a farm dog? You know, just kind of get into that kind of conversation. Oh, sure. Um, well, the Alapaha is uh, very much attached to their family. They prefer to be in the house. They prefer to be in their family's face. You know, they're I call them Velcro dogs. Uh, the thing that's nice a- about them, though, is that they can be calm and quiet and reserved in the home. And then they'll go out and, you know, do whatever activity you ask of them. You know, um, they're, a, they're a higher energy dog. You know, they're not super over the top high energy, but they are a higher energy dog. They do require plenty of exercise. Um, they do need a lot of socialization. They do need a lot of discipline. Um, this is a dog that does better with... Um, uh, like a balanced training method versus a positive only reinforcement training method. Uh, they can be same sex aggressive and they can be dog aggressive. And, you know, that is really touch and go with the breed because some of them can get along perfectly fine in a household with multiple dogs and others just prefer to be an only dog, you know, the only dog in the house. Um, I found them to be very good with my cats. I, they're very, they're fine with my chickens um, it, it really depends on what you expose them to early on, but this dog, and I know a lot of people don't like the word dominance, you know, but this dog tends to be very dominant. They like to be, you know, on the highest pecking order as far as like the household pets. And if you have more than, you know, one dominant breed in the house, you can end up with some issues, um, when it comes to this breed and other breeds of dogs. I find that my, all of my Alapahas, even the ones that I consider, um, aggressive or assertive with other dogs are all fine with my French bulldogs. So I don't know, you know, and my, our one little Frenchie, you know, she's a, she's a little terror. Uh, she's, she's, a. She likes to be the head honcho and she will put her paws up on some of my Alapahas and try to hump them. And they just completely allow her to do that. But she is the only one that can get away with anything like that. If another Alapaha tried that, you know, that there would be some problems. There would be problems. But um, this is definitely not a breed for everybody. This is not a breed that, you know, somebody that you know, has golden retrievers or, or Labradors or, you know, some of the more family pet type temperament dogs, um, would do well with, I'm not saying that they don't make good family pets. They do, but, you know, a home for an Alapaha is a family that's more, you know, disciplined into socialization, into training, um, into knowing what cues that the dogs, especially if you have like a multi-dog household, you really have to know, know and look at your dog and know the cues to show you that, you know, hey, this dog is getting stressed. This dog is getting upset and be willing to put the dog up, you know, and be willing to create and rotate if you have to. Like some of my dogs get along and some don't, but, you know, we're, we're willing to create and rotate our dogs within our home. Um, you know, because I would never dream of, of giving up one of my dogs just because they had, you know, um, issues with a housemate. Yeah, it's kind of what we're going through now with the three Frenchies. They're all around about the same age and two of them absolutely don't get along, but we just, uh, we just, you know, there's enough real estate that they can live, exactly. se- live separately. And, you know, the one that I have in my lap now loves to fight at the drop of a hat he doesn't care who it is he doesn't pick his spots and our big one um has become tough as nails and he's realized that he's probably the overall the toughest one of the bunch so he he's feeling his oats so they're little dogs in big dog suits it's a bulldog it's a bulldog yeah you know yeah yeah, they're all straightforward. I have an English bulldog, and um, people don't realize that sometimes English bulldogs can have those dominant traits as well. They think yes. that, that they're lovable. They're not. Some of them aren't. I've had several in my life, and this one, my 12-year-old now, um, he's you know subdued now. He's he's getting up there in age. So, but he was very dog aggressive, and um, he would bite before he would mm-hmm. he would uh, accept. 
it didn't matter what what it was and uh, even little kids he didn't like little kids so we didn't have little kids around so uh, didn't bother me i guess but um yeah you just manage you just manage those behaviors right and and that's why i tell people about getting into dogs and bull breeds and you know there's just some things that you got to put up with they're not plug and play dogs and right. don't don't get one if you want a labrador or a exactly. golden retriever and unfortunately that's my big soapbox is is that i see so many people that with these bull breeds that shouldn't own them i would say over half the people that have them shouldn't have them in my opinion. i would i would absolutely agree with that statement absolutely agree yeah um, bully yeah. breeds as a whole are not for your average, you know, companion type dog. You know, I mean, yeah, they make great companions and yes, they make great family pets. But, you know, like I said, again, for certain family mem for certain families that are willing to put up with a dominant type dog, you know, and, and, and be willing to do the proper training and the proper socialization, the proper discipline. I, that's the key to everything. That is the key to absolutely everything with a bulldog breed. Yeah. Everything from French to, an American or right. whatever and everything yeah. in between these dogs have certain things that they're not, um, um, they don't, you can't be a passive owner. You have to be an, an active owner. And I don't mean like getting up off the couch and running right. around and all you have to be actively involved in that dog's life. Right. Um, you know, if it's an English bulldog or a French bulldog, you have to be actively involved in their health and, and making sure that they have all their needs met as far as that's concerned. And, and then when you're talking Americans and the Lapahas that have more of a, a dominant, um, trait, you have to be, you know, cognizant of their abilities and all of that sort of stuff. So yeah, I, I totally, I totally am on that soapbox as much as I can be, uh, without pushing people away. But I, oh, I, just, I push people away and I have no problem doing it because, you know, yeah. I mean, it, all it, it ends up being life and death for some of these dogs. You know, if you place a dog in the improper home and it bites somebody, it bites the, the child in the household, something like that, that is a liability, you know, and it's, I care about this breed so much, so much. I would rather lose, you know, 10 people or more, whatever. It doesn't matter how many people I lose and turn off from the breed. If it would prevent somebody from getting hurt or prevent this breed from being looked at in a bad light, like you see with pit bulls, you know, like I, I care deeply about this breed and I do not want to see them, you know, in shelters and pounds and in rescues because they were, you know, because a family got them that really had no business owning this breed. You know, and it, and it comes down to being, you know, the, the breeder's fault, too. You really have to screen your buyers. You know, you need to you need to grill them. You need to ask them lots of questions. You know, you need to, for lack of a better word, you need to scare them. You know, and that's one of the first things I do when I talk to people is I try to scare them away from the breed first. And then mm -hmm. I'll talk to them. And then I'll ask them questions about, you know, are you are you willing to deal with a dominant breed that you might have to create and rotate? You know, that that you might have to put up. You know, that you have to have, you know, socialization and, and discipline and, you know, training, get a professional trainer, you know, don't be afraid to take your puppy to a professional trainer to help you out, you know, and what's cute, what's cute at eight weeks old as a little puppy is not cute when they're a year or two old and 90, 100 pounds, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're allowed to get away with stuff while they're small because they're cute, you know, and you're going to have a whole lot of problems on your hand when they're older. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well said. Very well said. Um, here's a question that, that I like to ask, and, and I know some people roll their eyes at this question, but it, for whatever reason, I think it's really important. And since I'm not like, I kind of like painting an overview and, and giving people kind of a visual. Um, that's my youngest French. But um, as far as what you're trying to breed, can you talk about the height and weight and structure that you think is, is optimum for what you're trying to do for your program and, you know, a, a good dog that could perform like say in the IPO ring and all of that. So a dog that's about 22 inches to 24 inches at the withers. And I like dogs that are 80 to 90 to even a hundred pounds. Um, when you're pushing the hundred pound mark, I do notice that you lose some, you know, quickness, uh, and the ability to turn quickly and to, you know, move 
you know, they can move fast, but they gas out a lot faster. So 90, 80, 90 pounds is kind of the sweet spot for what I see as far as being workable in IPO, personal protection work. Um, you know, females can be slightly smaller, although I tend to like my females to be the same size as the males. And that is like my personal goal is to make sure that all of my dogs are just pretty much, you know, the same height, the same weight across the board, whether it be a female or a male. But, you know, a smaller female is not considered a fault, you know. Um, so more of like a medium large dog versus, you know, being an extra large dog or, you know, a smaller medium sized dog. So I know that they vary in weight and size a lot. I know somebody that has a 45 pound Alapaha. And then I know somebody that has a 140 pound Alapaha, you know, and those are some really extremes on the scale. Whereas, you know, your 80, 90 pound dog is kind of the sweet spot. When you go to pick a puppy out of a litter, what are you, what are the traits that you're looking for? And, um, does that vary depending on what your needs are? And, uh, you know, just kind of give us an overview of that. That's a, that's a funny question. Cause I tend to go for the most dominant, you know, uh, I, for lack of a better word, nasty puppy. I go for the nasty puppy in the litter. Uh, and what I mean by nasty is like the one that's the first to go and, you know, put its mouth on everything. And, you know, yeah, they're really difficult and annoying. And, you know, they're like owning little piranhas or sharks. But that, you know, like when I pick a puppy from another breeder, I actually ask them to video the entire litter for me. And, you know, I ask them to push the puppies around a little bit you know, not, not cruel, not kick them, not, you know, not be cruel to them, but kind of push them around a little bit, you know, pinch their feet, you know, pinch the back of their necks or whatever, because I want to see how this puppy reacts. You know, if it, if it reacts startled, if it shuts down and runs into a corner, you know, I want to know all of that. So I tend to go for the most aggressive puppy in the litter because I find that the most aggressive puppies, you know, yeah, they're difficult to raise and yes, they're challenging, but they tend to be the smartest. The, the ones that, you know, the litter alphas, whatever you want to call it, tend to be the smartest out of the whole litter. And I like intelligence. Like when I, when I look for a dog, it's, intel it's intelligence above everything else. Because, you know, everything else you can work on, everything else can fall in place. But intelligence is also genetic. You know, like you, you want to find a dog that, you know, has healthy parents, you know. Um, I tend to like people that actually are active with their dogs that want to, you know, that that have titles on their dogs or whatever, because my goal for this dog is to be a working, and it should be, it's a working dog. It is a working bulldog breed. So you want to stay as close to, you know, their original function as possible. No, I'm not going out there and hog hunting. You know, um, I don't have the ability to do that now, but I would, I would absolutely put my dogs on hogs if I had the ability to do that. Um, and I, I'm confident that they would perform well, you know, because we try to stay true to type. Right. And could you talk about some of the modern health issues that you guys have to be concerned about and, and what has uh, the, the Alapa community done to, to try to curb some of that? Um, well, the um, most common problems I've seen in the breed and it's a manageable issue is allergies. Allergies are irritating, you know, but they are manageable. Um, some of the, you know, uh, hip dysplasia is a big thing. This breed is absolutely plugged with hip dysplasia. Um, elbow dysplasia as well, although it's not as common as hip dysplasia. Um, they can have entropian, ectopian. Um, that's where the eyelids flip in or out. Um, those are all, you know, easily surgically corrected, but um, there are dogs that suffer with heart issues. Uh, I've heard of several dogs that have, you know, literally drop dead from heart issues, young dogs. And then um, there's also issues with uh, seizure disorders. So, you know, unfortunately, there's only a handful of breeders that are actually trying to breed out these genetic defects, um, you know, because, you know, genetic testing is just like the tip of the iceberg, basically. All these dogs should have genetic testing through either Embark you know, which I prefer over all the other genetic tests or like, you know, wisdom panel, which isn't as great, but paw print genetics is good uh, to make sure that they don't carry any genetic diseases, basically. But, you know, 
the um, OFA testing them for, you know, orthopedic diseases is probably the most important thing you can do for these dogs, you know, and like I said, I've, I've, I've gone through eight dogs before I found dogs that were even breedable, you know, and at that point in time, I was so discouraged. I was ready to just completely give up, but you know, I'm just, I'm so madly in love with this breed and I want to do well and, and breed a better bulldog that, you know, we just, we would spay and neuter and, you know, let people know, Hey, this dog is going to have problems. You know, it's got hip dysplasia or whatever. And, you know, um, they live, they go live on to be fine pets, but you know, not breeding prospects. So I, uh, you know, for us, we OFA test all of our dogs, they're pen hipped, um, which is another orthopedic test, uh, testing like the laxity in the joints, um, you know, and, and, and the genetic testing as well. So there's, like I said, there's a handful of us that are working to breed, you know, uh, orthopedically sound dogs. And that's, you know, that's, that's one of our ultimate goals is to have, you know, orthopedic sound dogs. And we are, I, I believe I am the only kennel in the world that has had multi-generational OFA excellent hips. So, you know, that is, that is something that I would like to, you know, produce consistently. I mean, do I still produce dogs with hip dysplasia? Yes. I don't lie to people. You know, it still happens even, you know, I, I mean, I've bred two OFA goods together and they've still produced a dysplastic pup here and there. It's getting rarer and rarer that that happens. Um, but I think, I think as long as people are just slapping, you know, two dogs together just to have a litter, we're still going to continue to see these kinds of problems. So, you know, it's, it's really important for people to do their due diligence and to research, you know, who they get a puppy from. And to make sure that, you know, when, when somebody uses a blanket term like health testing, you know, health testing is some people can be taking the dog to the vet and getting a physical, you know, that's not health testing. You know, health testing is, you know, the basics like genetic testing and then the orthopedic testing as well. And also there is a uh, disease that's in our breed called Ehlers-Danlos. And that is a really horrible disease. Um, to where like it, it's fatal it's fatal they end up getting like scratches and their skin is very loose and they can tear and you know um so there's there's a a test that's specifically made for the alapaha um for the ellers danlos so you know testing is incredibly important with this breed and with any any breed every breeder should be doing their due diligence and doing the proper health testing you know because I don't want to break people's hearts. You know, I don't want to break families' hearts. I, I want them to be happy. I want them to, you know, have a dog that they can have for the dog's lifetime. Talk about um, that skin disorder. Um, do they, have they pinpointed where that came from? Um, or is it, you know, was it, does other, is there another breed that has that issue? There are other breeds that do have the issues. Um, I believe uh, Springer Spaniels, but it's a different form of the Ellers Danlos than the Alapaha. So the Alapaha has its very own form of Ellers Danlos. We've, I believe that we've isolated it to um, a dog called Cody, uh, Lana Detonka, Del Rio Lane. I believe, I am not completely sure, but I've heard that there has been litters of puppies born with Ellers Danlos for decades and the breeders would just call them. But to be fair, to be fair, there wasn't the genetic testing back there then like there is now. And um, it's only been recent that a litter of Ellers Danlos puppies were born. And that breeder sent the puppies over to a, um, the Missouri, uh, the, the laboratory over in Missouri. It's a veterinary laboratory over in, uh, Missouri, and they were able to isolate the gene that causes Ehlers-Danlos. And, you know, m a lot of the dogs carry the disease. So obviously, if you, breed, if you breed two dogs together that carry this disease, you could have an affected puppy. So, you know, I'm, it, it, and genetics is, a, genetics is a difficult thing because, you know, you can breed a carrier safely, but the goal is, is to breed out all carriers. You know, but if you you don't want to end up in a genetic bottleneck either. Meaning that like, if you have a dog that has OFA excellent hips, but carries Ehlers-Danlos, I'm going to breed that dog. 
because you know the the disease is never going to present itself in the the dog that's carrying and if you breed that dog to a non carrier you know maybe half the litter will be carriers themselves but then you test the whole litter and then you you know place those pups appropriately you know most of them should go to pet homes most of them you know but if there's another responsible breeder that is willing to take a carrier and test the entire litter and you know test the hips on the dogs and stuff like that then you know um you know you're you're only going to get a healthier dog you know breeding that way without ending up in a genetic bottleneck and in my mind the hips are more important right now because you can literally breed out this genetic diseases in one generation one generation is all it takes to breed out the disease but you know like i said if you only take dogs that you know say you're just taking dogs that don't carry this specific gene but you know they've got a crappy temperament or they're you know they're not structurally sound or they have you know hip dysplasia and stuff like that like you're just going to end up going around and around and around and around and we're not going to go anywhere so i i believe that you know genetic testing is very important but i also don't think that you should call every single carrier um you know and, and i think we really should be focused on hip health you know over almost anything right now and and heart health and heart health so those are things that take generations to breed out not one generation what, what kind of diet do you guys do you guys feed your dogs pro plan purina pro plan we, we feed the 30 20 the uh salmon and rice formula i just every single one of my dogs can eat that from my oldest to my youngest to my french bulldogs little puppies um i'm a big fan of purina pro plan it's uh you know and it's, it's what my vet feeds and recommends and she's a you know she's a reproduction specialist and you know she brings champion dalmatians and you know it's it's a food that we fed all their life we do end up we do give them a lot of raw though too um and i know a lot of people are like oh don't feed kibble and raw at the same time we've been doing it for over 30 years and i've never ever had a problem with any of my dogs feeding raw and kibble at the same time so you know when we when we get a deer you know the dogs all get organ meat they'll get all the bone um you know our, our family breeds um meat sheep so you know we get a lot of the organ meats and you know bones and stuff from the meat sheep um chicken you know whole chicken whole raw chicken whole raw eggs they all get a whole raw egg every day um i give supplements uh green lip muscle supplement it's for ligaments and joints um we've had really good results with that I've, I've got dogs that are 11 12 13 14 years old still running around i've got a nine-year-old female that can jump a five-foot fence you know and uh i you know the the main thing is is to keep them lean and fit that that is the biggest that is the biggest thing you can possibly do is keep your dog lean and fit you know um, diet diet's important yes but keeping your dog at a healthy body condition body weight is paramount what led you away from Connie Corsos? I, I love the breed. I love the breed, but I've I noticed that they weren't, you know, it was really hit and miss with the protection aspect of them. You know, some seemed overly defensive, you know, and I know the temperaments have gotten better since, you know, since I had them when I was a, you know, young person, uh, the breeders did, a good job working very very hard on making more stable dogs but uh when we were when back in the day when we had them i found them to be a little more on the unstable side um we even had a male that was you know dangerous for us to be around like my mom was the only one that could take care of him uh if there was a female and he, he used to come at me and i had to one time i cracked him over the head with a shovel to keep him away from me because he was coming at me hard and this is a 130 pound dog you know um and then others seemed a little more skittish and shy so it it was hard it was it was hard to have a nice level-headed connie corso and i'm not saying anything against the breed because i do love the breed it's one of my favorite breeds but the temperaments seem to be a little more hit and miss back in the day and i like i said i know the breeders have worked very very hard on on breeding more st stability in their in their dogs and you know um but i think a lot of them have lost their ability to be a protection dog and that their their temperaments have become more soft uh and i still tend to like a hard gritty dog you know because i i like defense work and i like protection work and you know i don't want to see this breed bred down to where they're nothing but couch potatoes and laying around on a couch farting and burping all day like that's just you know that that's not the kind of dog that i envision myself ever having um 
you know, I, I like my high trainability, high intelligence and, you know, the, the, I, I like a natural guardian. I don't want to have to pull, like try to pull that guardian instinct out of a dog. I want it already there. Right. That's why there's no cookie cutter method to training a dog. You know, I mean, some dogs would absolutely crumble if you use any kind of aversive training. Absolutely shut down and crumble. I've seen it. I've seen golden retrievers just completely shut down, lay on the ground and just turn into a pile of mush. You know, and then I've seen, you know, people try to positive reinforce train, you know, a, a more dominant bully breed or whatever. And they're just like, you can't tell me what to do. And they walk away from you and they go do their own thing. So like, you know, and like you were saying with your livestock guardians, like, you know, like, you know, adversive training isn't, isn't always the best, you know, um, tool, but I, I find with the Alapaha that, you know, it's, it's definitely a balanced training method to get the best, the, the best you can. And I've, you know, I've done positive only training with one of my dogs just to see how they would turn out. She is a spoiled run brat. She's terrible. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I can't do anything with her. She's adorable. I love her. But, you know, she's spoiled rotten brat. Doesn't want to do anything. You know, like, y y they're going to get full eventually. You cannot just keep tossing cookies at them continuously or, you know, trying to go out of your way to avoid situations that make them uncomfortable. You know, I want a dog that, you know, is going to be able to be in any situation and, you know, listen and respond to me appropriately. So, yeah, balance training is absolutely it for this breed. What would you rate the defensive drive to prey drive? Pit bulls were not bred to be defense dogs. They were genetically bred to be dog aggressive and to, you know, fight. They were, that's what they were bred for. They were bred for dog aggression. Um, pit bulls were bred to be able to be handled by men in pit rings. So, you know, if dogs were like in the middle of fighting, uh, a handler needed to be able to come up and break them up you know, and to attend to wounds or whatever, and then send them back into the ring. Um, whereas the Alapaha is, you know, um, it's, it's basically been bred to be, I, I hate using the term man aggressive, but a lot of the old school breeders, that's what they were going for was man aggression. Um, so I, I don't want a dog, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say this. So my, the first Alapaha show I went to in 2011, um, there were Alapahas that were going off at children. Like they were lunging, snarling. That does not impress me. That does not impress me in any way, shape or form because that is a liability. And if you're purposefully breeding dogs like that, I mean, shame on you, shame on you. Um, I want a dog that's naturally distrustful of strangers. I want a dog that's going to react appropriately if there's an actual threat. I do not want a dog that's just going to go up and bite anybody just because there's somebody there and that they're, you know, on your property. I don't want a dog like that. I want a dog that can think for itself. So, you know, I was, when I was looking for dogs for myself, I was very careful about who I selected my dogs from because I did not want dogs that were just going to go off and, you know, be indiscriminately aggressive and indiscriminate biters. Um, so, you know, I, the Alapaha still has, you know, and I think a lot of it has to do with the lack of training on, you know, the owner's part with this breed or encouraging that kind of behavior too, because they are genetically predispositioned to be guardians and to be distrustful of people. Um, and it is, it's absolutely high, hardwired into them to, you know, be aloof and distrustful of people. You know, most Lepahas are not going to be super social. You know, they're not going to want to be petted by strangers. You know, they're not going to want, it's not a good dog to take to a dog park. Like, you know, can some do it? Yeah, some can do it. Um, it's a lot of socialization and discipline on the owner's part. And, you know, I think they're playing with fire because it only takes one bad instance of a of an Alapaha getting into a fight and it's over. Like these dogs hold grudges like no breed I have ever seen before. And you know, it's it's almost like a switch flips in them um if they have a really bad experience with something, they don't forget it and they hold grudges. Bull breeds are just hardwired that way. They're built different. I tell people they only have one direction and it's straightforward. And if you get mm -hmm. in their way, they're going to try to bull you over. And, um, 
and again, like you said, they do hold grudges and they don't forget. So and very and, and I think you know West Bulbury people, we 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 kind of like that, you know that you know if it's manageable, we I like that tenacity and that and that bravery that comes with these breeds. Yes. But but it yeah. again, it comes. Yeah, with I, I think I would be bored to death with a Labrador or golden retriever, or I don't know, like a poodle or something. I think I would be absolutely bored to death. Yeah, for sure. Well, um, is there anything that we didn't talk because I know you got to get going here. I just looked at the time. Um, is there anything that we didn't talk about that you'd like to convey? Uh, I don't know. Do you have any additional questions? I think, I think I, spoke about the things that I wanted to talk about most, you know, temperament, health, you know, those, those things were paramount to, uh, this conversation today. Well, me. there is probably some questions that I will think of when I do the editing that I'm like, God damn it. I wish I would have asked, but, um, can we save it for maybe a part two? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Perfect. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you to our generous sponsors, Mark and Perla Lambert for supporting this video. Your contribution helps us continue to create valuable content for our audience. Please show your support to their YouTube channel, Jesus Answers Prayer, and tell them you heard about them from the Bulldog Social Club. If you're interested in sponsoring future episodes, please feel free to reach out. We'd love to collaborate with you. My email and phone number is listed in the description section of this video. Jesus Answers Prayers is a multi-platform ministry in both English and Spanish. Our mission is twofold. First is evangelism. We have the gospel presentation videos to help reach the lost and explain the basics of the gospel. The links can be found at the end of every video produced by this ministry. They also help in aiding the Christian in evangelism. Second is the education for the Christian community. God's word is very important to know. God doesn't speak in an audible voice to us, but he does speak through his word. If we don't read his word, then we can miss out. So knowing is important. And if you're anything like me, it can be hard to understand particular chapters and their meanings. So it's nice to have that commentary to help grow in the understanding of God's word. If you want to grow in your understanding of scripture, then you can find the Bible, a work in progress, book by book, chapter by chapter, with a corresponding Matthew Henry commentary. God bless and see you there. Jesús responde. Oraciones. Es un ministerio multiplataforma, tanto en inglés como en español. Nuestra misión es doble. La primera es la evangelización. Tenemos los videos de presentación del Evangelio para ayudar a alcanzar a los perdidos y explicar los conceptos básicos del Evangelio. Los enlaces se pueden encontrar al final de cada video producido por este ministerio. También ayudan al cristiano en la evangelización. En segundo lugar, está la educación para la comunidad cristiana. Es muy importante conocer la palabra de Dios. Dios no nos habla en voz audible, pero sí a través de su palabra. Si no leemos su palabra, entonces podemos perdernos. Entonces, saber es importante y, si eres como yo, puede resultar difícil comprender capítulos concretos y sus significados. Por eso es bueno tener ese comentario para ayudar a crecer en la comprensión de la Palabra de Dios. Si desea aumentar su comprensión de las Escrituras, puede encontrar la Biblia. Un trabajo en progreso, libro por libro, capítulo por capítulo, con el correspondiente comentario de Matthew Henry. Dios los bendiga y nos vemos allí. 